All right, joining me once again here on the Matthew Filipovich Show is Melissa Jira Grant. Melissa has written for The Nation magazine, The Guardian, Jezebel, The Washington Post. She is a contributing editor to Jacobin magazine. She's the author of the new book, Playing the Whore, the work of sex work, which you can find at melissajiragrant.com. You can also follow her on Twitter at Melissa Jira. Melissa, thank you so much for being on the show again. Hey, Matt, thanks for having me back. All right, so Melissa, you write in the book that you actually, one of your goals is to actually shift the focus from the sex workers themselves to the fantasies of prostitution that, quote, occupy and obsess those who seek to abolish control and profit off of sex work. I guess my first question for you would be, what exactly are those fantasies and why are they so harmful? That's exactly right. They start, you know, usually the topic of our conversations about sex work are these kinds of myths and fantasies and preoccupations of people who don't do sex work, um, who consider themselves to be experts on sex work because their their jobs and their focus, you know, puts them in a position to exert control over sex workers' lives. And the folks I identify in that group uh, would be the police, policymakers, and sometimes the press itself. So those fantasies that they are occupied with actually don't have very much to do at all with sex workers' own lives and realities. So when we hear stories from you know, high-profile columnists about efforts to go into brothels and forcibly remove sex workers in order to, quote-unquote, rescue them from their lives, when we hear stories from the police saying that, you know, when they arrest sex workers, they're not treating them as criminals, but they're treating them as victims because, you know, of course, no one would do sex work as far as they understand it unless they were coerced or forced. And then when policymakers believe that they can make laws that regulate sex work and control sex workers' lives without actually seeking the input of sex workers, they're doing that because they think that they understand the industry better than sex Sex workers do. So I wanted to really shift the focus to those players who are so often um, concerned with changing sex workers' behavior and saying, well, let's talk about your behavior. Let's talk about your opinions. How did you come to understand the sex industry this way? And more so, what do you get out of it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, it and yeah, it, it really is is true because, like, again, most of the time, you know, obviously high profile clowns like Nicholas Kristof for the New York Times. Uh, I, I know you devote a, a whole chapter in the book to the saviors and those who are just like trying to swoop in and, and save these poor these poor women. Uh, it, it's it's it really is. They never really do talk to the women themselves and and actually talk about and get their input on do they need to be saved and and and. and it, it, it really is pretty horrific that that these folks think that they know all the answers and know what's going on in these in these people's lives. And their focus is so on women, right? Even yeah. though, I mean, that's a great place to start because we know that the sex industry isn't an industry that only women work in. We know that men work in the sex industry. We know that folks who identify as, as trans or gender nonconforming work in the sex industry. Uh, we know that this is actually quite a broad and diverse industry. But when we get to the folks that, you know, you were just mentioning, like Nick Kristoff and, and others who kind of are concerned with this rescue narrative, um, you know, they are really focused on women in the sex industry, really to the exclusion of others. And that, to me, says that there's something going on here about gender and, and often also about sexuality that really animates their fantasies, that they really position themselves as the protectors and, as I put it, the saviors of, of women um, that they know best. And, and that's something that, you know, I would say most progressives would find pretty appalling when it comes to other social issues. The idea that, you know, these total outsiders understand best for people who actually face these things in their own lives. Or I don't know, maybe we'd like to think that. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's particularly concerning, I would say, for, for anybody who's involved in, in human rights advocacy to look at these kinds of efforts um, and see how they're almost exclusively led by outsiders. And even when the people that they're aiming to help protest, they push back. The rescuers push back and say, no, 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 this is for your own good, or, you know, you don't understand how victimized you really are. And and sometimes we'll even talk about things like a Stockholm type syndrome, right? That like the reason that sex workers are opposing them is because they have some kind of false consciousness or tra- trauma that has made them not understand what victims they are. And these are things I've even heard myself, um, not just from my own experience as a sex worker, but even as a journalist writing about this, that, you know, the reason that I talk about sex workers' work and and value the rights of sex workers um, is because I obviously don't understand how traumatizing sex work is. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, what's, what's, no, ab- absolutely. But also what's, what's so harmful about this is that the, the, the way that debate is framed has such potentially real life horrific consequences. I mean, in even the first chapter of the book, you describe the violence uh, that is uh, levied against sex, sex workers, mostly by things like the police. Talk a little bit about that and how these saviors and their attitudes actually very much contribute to actually violence against against the people they're trying to protect, supposedly. Right. It would be one thing if this were just about myths and fantasies, right? And these were just kind of stories. But we know that that stories and narrative play a really huge and influential role in in how policy plays out and, you know, more specifically here, what policing looks like in people's lives. And so when police, you know, hear this rhetoric and are empowered themselves by this idea that all sex workers are victims, then they can also view themselves as saviors. And they, you know, might not understand the act of arresting somebody as something that the person who's being arrested also, you know, that they experience it as something quite violent and quite traumatic. Um, But, you know, the narrative of, of rescue can allow the police to sit back and say, well, you know, I'm doing something to actually help you. Um, and to go to, you know, kind of a more extreme example of that, you know, historically police have been a significant source of violence to sex workers. And I don't think that that gets, you know, covered quite enough, particularly now when the narrative is tilting towards looking at police as, as rescuers. The idea that sex workers face not just harassment, Um, but also sexual assault and violence at the hands of police that, you know, when you have, as we do in the United States, laws that prohibit selling sex, laws that in a sense criminalize sex workers as human beings, um, they don't believe that they can actually rely on the police to protect them when they do face violence from anyone. And, you know, I've heard stories from women in the sex trade, particularly transgender women, have some of the most alarming stories of police violence because they will be harassed by police when they try to seek help, Um, which means that if they do actually experience violence um, from any source, they're not going to feel that they can turn to the police for recourse the way that anybody else could. And in some cases, the police themselves are exacerbating that violence by saying things like, well, I should have locked you up 